Welcome to The Lisa Show, where we take a good look at life. Have you ever gotten really excited about a creative pursuit? Maybe it was writing or painting or singing and thought, what if I just dropped everything and pursued this full time? Sell the house, quit your job, buy a used VW van and make a living from your art, even if you're not that good at it yet? I know I do this whenever I do improv with my friends. And then I stop and I ask myself, well, why Amy Poehler and Tina Fey aren't doing improvisational theater full-time. Yeah. Well, I do this with everything. I love to paint, and most of my paintings are dumb. But when it's a good one, I think, oh, should I just make prints of this and sell it on eBay? Like, should this be my career now? Is is this what I'm going to do with the rest of my life? But then reality hits, and I remember the utility bills and the doctor visits and the dental insurance and all those dreams come crashing down. So how then can we create a creative life? Over the course of this series on creativity, we've heard from actors, musicians, directors, artists, and all sorts of creative people who've shared their perspective on why creativity should matter to us. And I hope you felt empowered and inspired to take a step back and reevaluate what role creativity plays in your life. But in today's episode of The Lisa Show, I want to explore what it really means to live a creative life. I know people who've become famous and well-known for their art and do it full-time. And I know people who haven't quit their day jobs, or they have sort of a hybrid of different jobs, or they go forward relatively unknown. And what I've observed is that there is no one way to be fully creative. In fact, I'm fascinated by this idea. If you are your creative act full-time, why aren't you necessarily better at it and the happiest? It just doesn't seem to be the case from my observation. Even if we don't quit our day jobs, I think the way we live our lives is essentially the most creative act. So what does it mean to really bring creativity into our lives and live a creative life? That's what we'll be exploring in this episode. You know I'm going to want to hear what the Council of Moms has to say about all of this. But first, I want you to hear this definition of creativity from author Andrea Hardiman. Day to day, I think we try and box creativity into what it needs to look like. But I think anytime you're showing up as your authentic self, that is creativity because you're doing something different than other people and you're staying true to yourself, not to say that other people are not staying true to themselves because they can, but no one has your exact energy, has your exact way of seeing things. And that in and of itself is creative. In terms of poetry and art, how those sit in my life now, I still create as I am inspired. If I think something through, it's gonna look like trash. Andrea pointedly says, any time you're showing up as your authentic self, that is creativity. Is that really true? When I first heard her say this, it stopped me and it got me thinking. I know we're all individuals, but I also know that some people don't value creativity or use it, or maybe undervalue how they use it. And this idea that if she stops and thinks something through, it's going to be trash, or it just doesn't work, suggests there's an outside element to creativity that we are not always able to observe. You know, as a mother, I've seen my kids act and not think something through, and it seems counterintuitive to getting stuff done, like making art. But when I think about living life, the most creative act, I'm humbled when I remember that you really can overthink life, and sometimes you miss the best moments of discovery when you step outside to evaluate them instead of just being in them. Is this what Andrea means when she talks about the connection with self and art? To me, this idea from Andrea is a big shift in how I look at being creative. It doesn't necessarily matter what things look like from an outside perspective. What does matter is if you're allowing your individual, authentic, unique self to shine through whatever it is that you happen to be doing. It's so easy to say, hey, just live your best life. Um, Okay. But I really wanted to know what this idea looks like in the real world and not hypothetically. I asked Andrea to share her personal story of what she thinks creativity looks like. 
Andrea told me how, at the end of 2019, she was recovering from a head injury and had recently experienced some difficult personal losses. She explained how she started to find healing and to process all of those different emotions when we got into 2020. And it was talk about murder hornets killing the bees and how important they are to our ecosystem. And it was, you know, there was sensationalism around this could be World War III if we don't de-escalate the politics. And I was so ready for 2020. I was like, I'm going to take this by storm. I've been out for the count for six months. I'm starting to feel better. I've got this. And then I just felt knocked down at every turn. We went into lockdown. There was COVID. And then there was Brianna, Ahmad, and George. And I would go out in public. And I would be monitored and watched by white people sometimes. And I was uncomfortable and feared for my own personal safety, given how heightened everything was and the racial tensions in our climate. And I was spontaneously crying. And I know that's common for a lot of people because there was just so much going on and we're not meant to be isolated. And I lived alone and normally I would turn to poetry, but words felt so heavy. Andrea described how while she was stuck at home during the COVID lockdown, she decided to use redecorating her home as a creative outlet. But because she worked full-time in tech and that industry was going through a period of recession, she needed to find a way to decorate without spending money. I was like, I'll just, you know, buy some art supplies. I'll just make something. Mind you, I hadn't painted or created in (laughs) 15, 16 years. And what I created initially was not that great, but I was so proud because it got me to take my mind off of things. It was more about the process. And there was, I don't know what the moment was, but something opened up inside of me where I was able to to let go. And I started creating abstract art. And I would initially put the paint on my fingertips. And I have my early pieces, a lot of it I painted with my hands. I didn't use brushes. And I have this Jacle version of, or replica rather, of Gustav Klimt's The Kiss, which I love. And I was like, I want to make something that's complimentary. And it has this like little like sloping hill slightly. And so I kind of took that approach and it has an impressionist feel because it's my fingerprints as the brush strokes. And I borrowed from that color palette and I fell in love with that. And so I created a piece that I call Monet because it reminds me of his water lilies with the colors but it's just very different. It's completely abstract. And 2020 was this Phoenix moment for me where something awakened and it will not be moved. I cannot stuff that back down. And so art is is part of who I am. I've always been a poet and I've always been a creative, but there are times when I, I crave painting or it's the only way for me to get out whatever is going on in my body. I love her description of a phoenix moment rising from the ashes where she remembered what she already knew was true. She needed to create. It was more than something to kill time. It was essential to life. And I think we all remember those COVID days and can relate to Andrea. We started to knit and crochet, make stuff, I really tried a couple of sourdough starters. In full disclosure, I failed miserably. I mean, I grew stuff, but it did not turn into bread. And I'm sure like many others, I had already gone down the path of this is how I live now and convinced myself that I could make everything from scratch. I mean, that phase didn't last, but it made me feel good for a while. I did, however, get creative with the way I organized and reorganized my home. I know where to find tape, you guys, a hammer and my collection of wigs. That's my win. From my perspective, it does seem like that there was a conflict in Andrea's life, a sort of friction between her true authentic self and the tragic world events that were happening around her. 
And so she found a way to express her true self that helped her to process all the big emotions that 2020 brought about. And I think that kind of emotional resolution is empowering. When I can find a way to process and heal from difficult emotional conflict, it frees me to seek out ways to make changes for the better. But this all starts by knowing who you are and what you like. If you had me sewing and knitting to live my best life, I would have been a frustrated mess. But looking back, I realized it was organizing and writing and playing the piano that helped me discover more about who I am and what I like. For Andrea, it was painting that allowed her to find that empowering catharsis. But like I mentioned at the start of the episode, many of us don't have the bandwidth to take on a new hobby in order to express ourselves, or we feel this pressure to be great at the creative pursuits we see others do. So what can we do? You may remember Jack Uncalo. Earlier in the series, he told us about studies that he conducted regarding creativity and how it affects us. I asked Jack to tell me about his relationship with creativity, not as an artist, but as a researcher who has found ways to express his authentic self through his work. It really came as a reaction, not from being an environment that was welcoming of it, but being an environment that was stifling of it. And I think that my rebellious reaction to that underlies everything that I do. Jack told me about his childhood growing up in Central California, where his family and community kept him from broadening his horizons. As a kid, he felt discouraged from trying to be anything outside of the mold set by his peers. But when I went to Berkeley, I mean, it was like my eyes were open to the possibilities of a culture where it was okay to be different, where there was nothing to fit into, where you could believe religiously, whatever you want or not, um, where you could play team sports or not, as opposed to being rejected from them constantly. And so I had this sort of pre sort of mindset of this is, a, I, I knew in detail what a stifling environment was like, where people aren't accepted, where you're not permitted to be different, where there are, um, being an outsider is really a negative thing. Um, where you encounter social rejection every day you go to PE class when you're picked last for the team. And I went through all of that. And so, you know, I arrived at, I think, at, in college as a very sort of angry, resentful person. And then I took a course from Charlotte Nemeth, who is, um, is uh, to this day a mentor of mine at, at Berkeley. Wow. And she talked about the value of dissent and how people who dare to dissent against the majority, help everyone else think differently, to think more carefully, to be more deliberative. Um, and, and creatives are unusual, and yet they offer so much value. I love this idea of dissent. Sometimes it can feel like a radical act to try and be ourselves. Getting past worrying what everyone else is thinking and doing is easier said than done. We're not always socially rewarded for being ourselves. I think I'm pretty self-aware, but I'm sure I have blind spots like everyone else. I do worry sometimes that I'm too loud, I talk too much, and I'm just a little too excited about dumb stuff, more than normal or on average. And while I try to be self-aware in social situations and not be rude and take over, and I can certainly adapt to make myself blend appropriately in social situations, I am just full of a desire to connect with people and find out what makes them tick. I want to make people laugh. I do want to look on the bright side of things. And it's annoying even to me sometimes, but I've tried to suppress it and it just doesn't feel good. (laughs) You might be thinking, okay, well, what do personality traits have to do with creativity? I think it's our first and maybe purest clue about what we like and how we are going to express ourselves. I mean, we have to know who we are before we can show up authentically in the world. And creativity is how we express who we are. When I moved to England, oh man, I felt like I stuck out and not in a good way. I was too friendly. I was too fancy. I was too chatty. (laughs) And that's just the feedback said to my face. But I learned that in that really growing year that showing up as myself was the way to feel happy and not depressed. I learned that year how much of an extrovert I was and how much I missed connecting and creating with my friends because I didn't have an opportunity to do it so far away. I tried to be more quiet. And I tried more quiet, isolated pursuits, and it 
just wasn't the same. It was a great way for me to get to know myself better. <laughs> in England, I threw a Halloween party. And no one really celebrated Halloween in the American way in this small seaside town we lived in. They were just vaguely aware of the holiday. And I was not deterred. I decorated. I invited my new friends and their kids that I had met at a variety of playgroups around town. I made dirt cups and worms, you know, with the crushed up Oreos and gummy worms. Classic American fancy school treat. And I had Halloween books and songs for our preschool crowd. I was so excited. And I turned our little flat into a spooky wonderland. (laughs) <laughs> or so I thought. The party was a huge flop. Not funny at the time, but super funny now. The kids were disgusted by the treats. They wouldn't eat them. Even though I explained that they weren't real, you know, worms and dirt. Some kids got scared and started crying. One kind of older girl around seven or eight kept asking, why are we doing this? The parents all apologized and I was super embarrassed. The end. When I think of that story now, it makes me laugh. I was so lost in England. My husband was using his talents and doing exactly what he wanted to do to create by studying, directing, and Shakespeare. I was trying to create a childhood for my two young children. My husband and I were in the middle of creating the kind of life we wanted for our family. I felt like I didn't fit in with how a lot of other moms were doing things. And to be honest, I didn't fit in with everyone. And when I came back from England, I knew myself better, and I knew I needed to create with others to feel like me. It often seems easier to just blend in and conform how we are to what everyone else expects us to be. But I know, and I've seen, that white-knuckling our personalities into fitting with the status quo doesn't pay off in the long term. While we might fit in better right now, we'll just end up looking back on our lives and missing all of the fulfillment we could have had by just being who we truly wanted to be. Jack continued by telling me how the freedom to dissent and freely express himself empowered him to write the kinds of research papers that he wanted to write. It provided really kind of a blueprint for the rest of my professional life in terms of thinking about knowing, having this visceral experience of of negativity around this and then having a way forward that sort of validated that, yeah, my experience was pretty awful but it doesn't have to be that way. And I can go about, you know, step by step through all these papers, really sort of talking about this. And I think that that's where the social rejection piece really resonated, where, Mm -hmm. yes, you can be rejected. You can interpret it in a way that leads you to believe that you are different in a way that is of value. And you can do something with that, um, which is to approach the world in a way that's unique. And um, so I think I hope that it's hopeful. And I think that there are other people you know, not everyone makes it and can say at the end that like, yeah, I used all of that negative stuff to fuel in a career and <laughs> and I just have endless stories to tell throughout paper after paper after paper because I have this sort of, um, you know, experience to draw on. Approaching the world in a unique way is easier said than done. Certain creative pursuits, body shapes, personalities, social trends go in and out of style. If your identity doesn't match up with what's in style, which is an always moving, pretty ethereal target, it can make drawing on your experience when you create more open to criticism and judgment. And I know this is going to be a shock to some of you, but performing improv isn't really punk rock or cool. I know, I know. You're thinking, Lisa, what are you talking about? I know, I know. But I'm here to tell you that it would be a lot more socially acceptable if when people ask me what I like to do, especially in those early years, before the TV show show show-offs, before movies and commercials, when it was just what I love doing, if I said, oh, I like to build furniture or write songs. I get it. I'm aware. But this is what I wanted to do, and I felt myself the most, more than any other hobby or creative outlet I've tried. I've used improvisation in my parenting, in my work. It's the energy I bring when I show up as myself, and it's not traditionally cool. I understand. I just don't care. Honestly, it's a lot of work to arrange for it, set it up, 
to do it, it would be so much easier for all of these reasons to pick something else. But I would be betraying myself if I suddenly said, nah, I don't like this. I'm not doing this. Beyond that initial feeling of, oh, this is just what I love doing, that creative act of being yourself in any situation, just the creative art of being, even when it would seem easier not to, is a reflection of your divine identity and worth. How we show up in the world, how we talk to people, what kinds of relationships we have, what we do for work, how we perform that work, what we do when we have free time, what we think and dream about are all creative elements that make up who we are and who we are becoming. There's so much value and art in creating your life and it has immeasurable worth. It matters. It's harder to see and apply this for myself, especially on mundane or difficult days, but I can see the individual and unique value in each of my kids always. And that has been a really powerful way for me to really grasp how that must be a reflection of how God sees us all of the time. This idea, not only the opportunity, but the divine inheritance that we have to create our lives has always fascinated me. I've seen it in myself, in my kids, and I wanted to know how other people have experienced it. So I asked Lauren Johnston and Kimberly Beatty from the Council of Moms to share with me how living creatively helps them connect to their divine identity. Here's what Lauren shared. I think that's why creativity is so cathartic because it is like reaching, you know, to create something from nothing or together with other people is kind of just the fullest, you know, uh, most divine thing we can do, I think, to make beauty where there wasn't, you know, before or in, in whatever capacity we want to do that. And so I think um, creativity has been so helpful to me in mental health just because it's it soothes my soul it it, it just feels uh, right I guess and and when I haven't had times in my life where I've had some sort of outlet where I've just not made the effort or sought that out um, I, I felt less connected with myself and less um, certain of who I was and so I feel like it's so important to find whatever it is cross stitch your pop and lock whatever <laughs> whatever it is all the hip I love it cross stitch or pop and lock <laughs> and choose yeah. one of those those is the two. only option <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could pop and lock, and maybe someday I'll take the time to learn. But I love this from Lauren. It's an idea that we explored more in episode two of this series, that when we connect better with ourselves, we're also connecting to a higher power. Here's what Kimberly had to say. Interesting, because the connection between the creativity and being my own self and like reaching my potential, I do feel like has been connected to God and my view of what is expected of me. I used to view it as very much like God expects me to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. But that is not how life operates most of the time. Like you can do your best and life won't turn out the way you thought it would. Oh. You know. Tell me more. Yes. <laughs> As an expert. Um, so I, I learned that while this life, living on planet Earth, being a human, part of the human experience is chaos, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that there's not joy to be found in the chaos and that I am free to take whatever chaos and make it whatever I want it to be. I get to make my life. I used to feel this burden of like, what does God want me to do? And it took a long time for me to finally get this feeling like, God wants me to do whatever I want to do. Like, I'm a good person who looks out for others. I try to be kind wherever I can. I'm ambitious. I'm loving. God wants me to do what I want because I am doing good. So create your life. Create your life in whatever way you want it to look like. And yeah, it's chaotic, but grab this piece, take that one, and make something really crazy beautiful out of it. During this series on The Lisa Show, in episode one, we talked about what it means to be a creative. In episode two, we've talked about why creativity is worth investing in. We've talked about silencing your inner critic in episode three. And in this episode, we've talked about how a truly creative life is an authentic expression of who you are. But if after all of that talking, you only hang on to one thing, I hope it's an understanding that you have infinite worth 
and creative potential, and expressing it will help you live a more authentic, happy life. I really believe that. Maybe I'll learn to pop and lock someday, maybe I won't. But I know that I'm pretty done with trying anything sewing related. I love nerdy improv, and no, I'm not apologizing for it. It has helped me express myself, connect with others, and adds value to the world. It has aligned me to living a creative life. And more than just knowing our likes and dislikes, the way you live your life and show up in the world has an effect on others and the world and is the most creative act. You have a unique and valuable identity that is worth expressing and sharing with those around you. We all have something worth offering in the world, and that's what living a creative life is all about. The Lisa Show is a production of BYU Radio. The show is hosted by Lisa Valentine Clark and produced by McKay Menden and Becca Hurley with help from Michael Combs, Avery Stonely, and Victoria Rymington with music and post production by Josh Fouts and Gracie Davis. <laughs>